Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. Uh, I'm sure many people here uh, in this building, our wonderful building for the first time, and so we'd like to extend a special welcome to you, uh, but also an equally special welcome to those who are returning who've been here before. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wolf. I'm the Blavatnik Professor of Public Policy here at the school. And I'm just going to uh, start us off by telling you one or two things about the prize and its relation to the school. Uh, the Kyoto Prize is an international award to honor those who have contributed significantly to the scientific, cultural, and spiritual betterment of humankind. The Blavatnik School of Government is honored to bring the Kyoto Prize laureates for a series of events each May, including lectures by each of the three laureates each year here in this building. The building is particularly appropriate, and this part of the building is exactly the right venue for these lectures because it's called the Inamori Forum, named after Kazuo Inamori, the founder of the foundation, the Inamori Foundation, which has awarded the Kyoto Prize since 1985. And we're delighted that representatives of the foundation are with us here today. This afternoon's lecture by Joan Jonas, 2018 Laureate for Arts and Philosophy, is the concluding main event for this year, although it will be followed by a closing drinks reception on the level four terrace, uh, out of doors on the fourth floor, the weather has been very kind to us this year, so it should be a wonderful drinks reception on the fourth floor uh, to which you're all invited. Uh, the talk will be moderated by Professor Anthony Gardner, head of school at the Ruskin School of Art, who I'd like to invite to the stage now. Anthony. She is a poet. She is a translator. She is a choreographer, a performer, an explorer of myths, and a maker of rituals, and an inveterate and curious traveler, I have since found out. She is an artist whose work stands among the most important and influential in the 50 years that she has been practicing her craft. And it is an honor indeed for Oxford to welcome Joan Jonas to the city as one of this year's Kyoto Prize laureates. Joan's work uh, spans film and video, performance, pedagogy, installation, sound, costumes, painting and drawing, and all of the spaces that lie between them. If you were to think of any of the major concerns uh, of art making today, you will invariably find that Joan Jonas is one of its pioneers. Interdisciplinary and collaborative art practices, new media work that sits between the self and the social, feminist art practices, art that communicates across cultures, across histories, with other people and other species with which we share this planet, and which is always always deeply concerned with the environment, with place, with possibility. And she does it actually with a deftness and something that is all too rare in contemporary art, and that is a wonderful sense of humor. It's little wonder then that Joan is such a key figure for so many artists who have come after her as well as the next generations coming through art schools like Oxford University's own Ruskin School of Art. She has presented her work at some of the world's most important venues, a remarkable six times that she has been in the great quinquennial exhibition called Documenta, held in Kassel in Germany every five years, including one of the landmark exhibitions of the post-war period, Documenta V in 1972. She was the US representative at the Venice Biennale in 2015, and in the groundbreaking, extraordinary exhibition called Whack, Art and the Feminist Revolution that started in 2007. 
Her many, 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 many solo exhibitions include the 1994 survey at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, in 2003 at the Queen's Museum of Art in New York, and an exhibition that I'm sure many of you will have seen at Tate Modern last year. In fact, uh, we're especially lucky uh, to have Pint Joan uh, during a very busy exhibition schedule at the moment, as she's actually en route between another major presentation in Venice that's just opened, alongside the Biennale, actually, and the next iteration of her Tate show, which is taking place at the Sorovis Museum in Porto. And while she's developed one of the most respected art practices in the world, she's also been a dedicated teacher at some of the world's leading art schools, including UCLA, in Stuttgart, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, where she is Professor Emerita in the Art, Culture, and Technology program, one of the most important and significant art programs in the world. In an age when we need to think very carefully and very critically about the glut of images around us, and when the pressures of social media and selfie culture are so potent, I think it's safe to say that Joan's work speaks perhaps more powerfully today than ever. We were incredibly fortunate to hear Joan in conversation yesterday at the Ruskin with our students and artists, and it's a great honor for us to be able to continue that conversation today. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the Kyoto Prize Laureate for her extraordinary contribution, unparalleled contribution to the arts and humanities. Joan Jonas, thank you. I haven't stood here yet, so I'm just going to do this. Is that okay? Yes. Um, thank you so much. And it's um, thrilling to be here in Oxford. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be the recipient of this amazing prize. Words cannot say. Um, I also want to say that um, the people, um, some of the people involved with the Inamore Foundation, in particular, um, um, Shinobu, Inamori Kanazawa, the daughter, has been, and the others who are sitting in the front row, they've been to all of our lectures, nine, in, in, including the ones in Kyoto, in San Diego, and here. And thank you so much for, um, for that attention and dedication. Um, I'll just say briefly that when I was asked to do a talk, for the Kyoto Prize, the first time in Kyoto, they, they, I had to do, they wanted us to write it out, which I've never done before for my lectures. I always um, improvise. And um, so it was quite a task. And they also asked me to include certain things about my life, childhood, and family, which I also have never done. But I didn't cut the uh, talk at all. I'm just going to read it as it was written for that occasion. Growing up, I spent summers at the summer home of my maternal grandmother, Florence Dollier, in New Hampshire. With a friend, I would put on amateur theater performances and spent a lot of time in the woods and the fields that surrounded the house. I had a dog named Cindy. I have had dogs all my life, and they have become a part of my work. Winters, we lived in New York City, and as a child, I went to the Metropolitan Museum and the Museum of Modern Art with my mother. My mother took me to the opera, and I brought my dolls to play with. I remember noticing male and female Wagnerian characters on the stage while playing with the dolls on my lap. My family moved six different times within New York before I turned 11. I went to two different schools, one progressive and one more conventional. At the more progressive school, I just wanted to paint. At the more, I just, um, yeah, sorry. For my last two years of high school, I was sent to boarding school in Vermont. This continuous displacement led to the forming of an outsider's life view. My memory is that, OK, this is a new place. I have to adjust each time. My father, Curtis Edwards, lived on a boat and was constantly moving around. I never knew when he was going to show up. 
He spent some time in Mexico every year and had a talent for photography and cooking. He introduced me to the modernist poets and literature. He encouraged me to be an artist, I believe, because he never succeeded in his own attempts at becoming a writer. In graduate school at Columbia University, I studied early 20th century poetry, which greatly affected the way I think about the structure of a work. The form of the haiku was very important to the images, who were a major influence on me. My parents divorced, and my mother married Dick Turner, a jazz musician in his youth, and a talented amateur magician, which were both also thwarted talents. My earliest influences were magic shows, in addition to the circus and Broadway musicals, and of course, 50s television and movies. My father's second wife had a sister named Jeanne Reynaud, who was a mosaic artist and a collector. She was very involved in the New York art scene of the time, and knew Archiel Gorky, Willem de Kooning, Marcel Duchamp, among others. It was through an indirect exposure to this world that I became aware of the modern art circles of New York. In university, my studies were in art history, literature, and sculpture. Then I went to art school and continued with sculpture while concentrating on drawing, drawing being the basic element of my work. When I switched from sculpture to performance in the mid-1960s, I had to think about this new form and consider how to work with it in order to develop a new language. I made this statement at the time. I don't see a major difference between a poem, a sculpture, a film, or a dance. A gesture has for me the same weight as a drawing. Draw, erase, draw, erase, memory erased. While I was studying art history, I looked carefully at the space of paintings, films, and sculpture how illusions are created within a framed space, and how to deal with a real physical space with depth and distance. When I switched from sculpture to performance, I just went to a space and looked at it. I would imagine how it would look to an audience, what they would be looking at, and how they would perceive the ambiguities and illusions of the space. An idea for a piece would come just from looking until my vision blurred. I would also begin with a mirror, a cone, a TV, a story. Sassetta and Piero della Francesca were are two Renaissance painters that I really loved. I was interested in the geometric forms and how the space of architecture was depicted in the space of the city. In Sassetta, I was drawn to the form, the delicate colors, the magic. In Piero, it was the placement of figures in the space of architecture, how they stood and seemed to gesture. A major direct influence was Alberto Giacometti. His figures, sometimes tiny, sometimes enormous, occupied and commanded a focused space. This element of illusion was also in the circus and the magic shows I had seen as a child. This idea of alchemy, the transformation of material, is essential. From the very beginning, nature has been a context for my work. Since childhood, I have loved the outdoors, playing in the woods in New Hampshire, putting on plays with my friends in various wild gardens and watching thunderstorms move across the valleys. These were high points. The first time I really understood why people made up stories about the gods was when I went to the southwest of the United States and saw the landscape there. It was so overwhelming in an unexplainable way that I understood why it had to be explained by myths and stories. When I made Wind in 1968, it was filmed outdoors on the coldest day of the year, though it was based on an indoor piece. The wind became a character and a force. The wind turned what could have been familiar everyday movements into a comedy of chaos. Forces of nature in the landscape continue to be a major presence. I was very influenced by film as well as by modernist poetry and literature. I learned so much from looking at the early films of Vertov, Eisenstein, Podovkin, Ozu, and others. I was drawn to the idea of one image next to another, and in a related way, to the use of a series of close-ups to build a narrative. I was affected by the use of landscape and the contrasting close-ups of animals, flowers, children, and people. The Russians, like other early filmmakers, were attracted to the activities of everyday movement. After seeing silent films, one was more aware of how sound could be used in a particular way. When I was in high school during the 50s in Northport, Long Island, I saw my first Japanese film. It was called Ugetsu, 
by Kenji Mizuguchi. And it intrigued and startled me at the same time. I was taken aback by its style of acting and its imagery. I had never seen anything like it. I began my study of film by attending film screenings in New York at Anthology Film Archives, established by Jonas Mikas. Recently, they sponsored the restoration of my two films, Wind and Song Delay. Metaphor is an aspect of my visual language. How does one tell a story with sound and image in time? What is the function of an image? In modernist poetry, the structure of a haiku can combine two images to make a third, like Ezra Pound's in the station of the metro in 1913. The apparition of these faces in a crowd petals on a wet black bow. When I began to work in time-based media, I had to invent ways of structuring sequences of images, so I worked with the language of montage in composing my work. In the 1960s, when I first wanted to make performance-based work, I attended dance workshops, performances, and happenings by visual artists and dancers. I was also looking at film, painting, and sculpture, how art is a dialogue with the past and the future. I am constantly looking for most, both familiar and strange objects in flea markets at home and away that might become props in my work. The objects I use are not literal adaptations of the elements in the story, but are symbolic, archetypal. For example, the actuality of the form, the cone, was an instrument to channel sound to the audience. I could whisper in their ears, look through it, listen to it, yell through it, sing, always directing sound to a place. Funnel, a piece I did in 1974, was based on the form of a cone. I made many paper cones of different sizes and proportions. I started working with nine foot tin cones in 76 and continue to be inspired by this shape. My inspiration includes travel, collecting objects, and the practices of other cultures and their rituals. Ritual is part of my language, my own ritual, although I'm interested in the ritual of other cultures. In studying art history, every painting has a story, and many practices begin in ritual. The No Theater began as ritual. I studied the early periods of art, the Minoan and the Mycenaean period. I spent a year in Greece and several months in Crete because I was drawn to the Minoan myths of the women diving in the sea with the dolphins. In the 1960s, when I was doing research and getting prepared to go into performance, I saw the Hopi snake dance in the Southwest, which was amazing, outdoors, and beautiful. All of these ideas have continued through the years and have been applied in different ways to later works. They have to do with my way of performing, my way of disguising myself, and working in relation to the camera. How to alter the image through the various media and then alter what is there later, using layering devices and reflection to alter how the audience perceives what they see. I have continuously stepped from the making of performance to making autonomous films and video works to installation and back while moving images and ideas from each to the other. The first prop that I used was the mirror. And as you saw in wind, we had costumes with mirrors pasted onto them. I got the idea from reading the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges. I was very intrigued by how he wrote about mirrors in space and the infinite multiplication of space as a library, the endless library that went on and on. So I made several performances with mirrors. These pieces consisted of a group of about 17 people walking very slowly, very carefully, moving in choreographed movements in the space. The mirrors faced the audience. In turn, the audience saw the reflected fractured space, the other performers, and themselves. So what you're seeing now is a recent reconstruction from notes and photographs of mirror piece one and two, which was originally performed in the 1960s and early 70s. The mirror was a metaphor for me, a device to alter the image and to include the audience as reflection, making them uneasy as they view themselves in public. The fragility of the mirrors and glass that could actually break also caused discomfort. Beauty with an edge offset. Other outdoor pieces also involved the viewpoint of the audience. 
My early work developed in a particular context and place. In the 60s, some parts of New York looked like ruins. Parts of the Lower West Side, for example, and the docks nearby along the Hudson River. These were places to explore. The first outdoor piece, Jones Beach piece, in 1970 was about perception in the distance, how sound is delayed by distance. One sees the action, and split seconds later, one hears the sound. Space is flattened by the distance. Certainly one can relate to it to the history of painting and representation of flatness and the idea of trying to, re to create the illusion of depth through perspective of, co of color and form. I went to Japan in 1970 and saw the No Theater. It had a significant influence on me and my work. It was then that I started experimenting with masks and used them in the outdoor works. Masks hid my face from the audience and gave me another persona. They inspire me to move in a different way, behave in a different way, and mask my personality, which I like. The sound of wood hitting wood in the no inspired me to work with wood blocks, clapping the sound delay in my outdoor performances. What you're seeing now is a piece called Nova Scotia Beach Dance. Although the piece was happening on the beach itself, it was seen from overhead by a group standing on the cliff above. I've spent every summer since 1970 in Cape Breton, Canada, and every summer I record the landscape and perform for the video camera. When I moved to Soho in 68, it was relatively empty, and artists were able to move into old, recently abandoned factory lofts that had the beauty of another time. It wasn't expensive to find a place to perform or exhibit one's work. You could work on the street, lots, and docks without getting permission from the city. You could work, you, well, my performance and video reflected that setting. It was an atmosphere grainy and rough. This performance is delay, delay from 1972 with a group of people who, as usual, were friends and artists. For instance, Gordon Mata Clark is in this piece. I would work on location, in this case, the empty lots of the Lower West Side of New York for a few months with ideas developed at Jones Beach and the Nova Scotia Beach Dance, and then rehearse with a group before performing in public. For delay, delay, the audience sat on the roof of a loft building on Chambers Street, overlooking these empty lots where old factory buildings had been turned, torn down. This work dealt with the perception of distance from an overhead view. This film, Song Delay, was based on Delay Delay and shot in this location. In order to recreate the illusion of the space, in other words, the distance and the activity, over a wide viewpoint, I worked with a filmmaker, Robert Fiore, and we used two lenses, a telephoto lens, since you wouldn't be able to see the sound delay in the distance through a normal lens, and a wide-angle lens to record the area of the empty lots. It was pure accident that boats went by up and down the Hudson River in the background as we recorded. We were very lucky. Every time we started to record the wood clapping sound delay, the boats went by. I just want to put a little, uh, when I came, before I began this work, I met Richard Long here, and he told me about reggae music and sent me to Portobello Road, and so this is my first um, use of reggae music, and this is one of my favorite songs. Here we see an image of Organic Honey's visual telepathy, the first video performance that I ever did. 
I bought a video camera in Japan in 1970 and started working with closed circuit video systems, which was quite a revolutionary video system at that time. Artists seeing themselves live, performing and recording at the same time. This was unlike recording in film, where you couldn't see the result of a recording until later. It was a radical moment. This device altered my way of performing. I began to perform for the camera. I didn't want to be recognized as myself, so I wore masks. I dressed up. I played with disguise. I developed imaginary characters or states of mind, alter egos. In a way, I found myself in the mirror works and through video transformations. Organic Honey's visual telepathy evolved as I found myself continually investigating my own image in the monitor of my video machine. I then bought a mask of a doll space, which transformed me into an erotic seductress. I named this TV persona Organic Honey. I became increasingly obsessed with following the process of my own theatricality as my images fluctuated between the narcissistic and a more abstract representation. The risk was to, in becoming too submerged in solipsistic gestures. In exploring the possibility of female imagery, thinking always of a magic show, I attempted to fashion a dialogue between my different disguises and the fantasies they suggested. This was in part inspired by the feminist movement of the time. I always kept my eyes on the small monitor in the performance area in order to control the image. There was a live camera in the performance space. At first I operated the camera, but later I had a camera person as performer. All movements and shots were set up beforehand and rehearsed. There is a small monitor in the space so that I, the performer, could frame my actions. The audience saw this live performance simultaneously with the image transmitted from the camera to the projection and or the monitor. This was often a detail of the live action, so the experience was of a double narrative linked. In subsequent video performances, I continue to explore this space of perception. I am interested in drawing during performance. A drawing in a performance is different than drawing alone in my studio, where there are no witnesses. The performance affects the drawing. As organic honey, I drew for the monitor while looking at the monitor and not at the drawing. I think continuously of how to work with screens, how to design the screen, and how to work with projection on the screen. I'm interested in creating my own special effects using my own technological trickery. Mirage from 1976 was de designed particularly for the anthology film archives. It was the last of a series of video performances working with early black and white technology and was structured in relation to the projection screen of the cinematic, of the uh, film, uh, anthology film archives. Because one could change the size and shape of the screen, various movements were performed in relation to these shapes. A large monitor turned on its side, played pre-recorded videos such as May Windows and Good Night, Good Morning. These works were recorded by a camera turned on its side to fit the vertical format. In this piece, I included two 16 millimeter films, a drawing film and a film of volcano eruptions, both projected. However, the screens were mostly blank, serving as backdrops for my movements on the small black wooden table or stage. Sometimes, if the screen was backlit, one could see through it and we performed behind the screen, working with the transparency. I did not include the live camera linked to the closed circuit. Props included a group of nine-foot tin cones, a small hoop, and a Central American wooden mask of a man. For the 30-minute film shot by Babette Mangold, I made a series of drawings on a blackboard, drawing and erasing, in this case, images or symbols that were part of my vocabulary. This is a weather symbol and a heart I drew over and over, a basic iconic image. I was inspired by the films of Maya Darren, the American filmmaker who spent time in Haiti filming the voodoo rituals. Practitioners were making drawings over and over again on the dark ground with lines of white powder. I refer to this piece, and I've used this drawing film in other works or as part of the installation version of Mirage. Mirage is a piece that I go back to in order to develop certain aspects of it in new work. It interests me to go back to an early work, take a part of it, and work with it in relation to other material. I'm interested in how the content is altered by juxtaposition or by being in a different context. I sat in the top of a television set, which was turned on its side in a vertical position 
and made a series of gestures. The image of the cone inspired me to include volcano footage. The whole piece involved the idea of opposites. It was an abstract piece dealing with light and dark. This is the juniper tree, the first version. In 1976, I started working with narrative or storytelling inspired by prose fiction. As with the mirror, the video, the outdoor work, narrative, I would say, was another altering media in which the image relates to a story and is affected by the story. This is the first version of the juniper tree based on a fairy tale by the Grimm brothers. It was made for children, which interests me, to have children react and respond to work. I later altered that piece and turned it into a work not just for children, though children could have seen it. I made a structure or a stage set. For instance, I represented the tree with a ladder, which is an iconic way of representing a tree. The wood and rope structure was the house. I made red and white drawings. When I begin working with a story, I analyze it, take it apart, and I note the colors. In this case, red and white. Red is blood and white is snow, very traditional fairy tale colors. In this particular fairy tale, there is a boy and a girl. In the performance for children, we played all the characters. In this version, I represented the characters. On the red cloth, I drew an anatomical heart and turned it into a face representing the boy. On the white cloth for the girl, I drew a valentine heart and turned that into a face. Each step at a different moment in the performance. I then hung the drawings on the wall. They became part of the set. I make drawings and performance relating to the content while exploring each time a different medium or way of making the drawing. This was in the Whitechapel Gallery in London before it was renovated. It was slightly altered for this beautiful space. Installations are adjusted for various situations. In 1994, when I had a show at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, it was the first time since stage sets in 76 that I had a major show of installations that were translations of performances. I also made a new work that was first an installation and then was translated into a performance in collaboration with a theater group in Amsterdam. It was called Revolted by the Thought of Known Places, based on an Irish 8th century epic poem, Sweeney Estray, translated by Seamus Heaney. This is the installation of Organic Honey. I wanted the audience to experience the work in a different way. I take all the elements, the video, the sound, the structures, the screen, the props, and I reconstruct them. In other words, I take the performance apart so it's not based on linear time, but exists in a different experience of time. The audience chooses what to look up and when. As they walk through the piece, the sounds of the different videos play together. Later, when I started working with more lyrical sound or music, there were different solutions with each installation. This is what interests me now, the form of the installation, this way of exhibiting a work in a space that I construct. This is the installation version of Mirage, as I mentioned earlier, the two films side by side, the drawing film and the film I made to go with it. The second fil con film consisted of footage shot in the early 70s and includes footage shot off the TV at the time because I wanted to bring everyday current events of the time that I was making these Mirage in 70s into the work and juxtapose what I was doing in the privacy of my studio with what was going on in the world around me. Since the juniper tree, when I work with a narrative or a story, I'm very aware of what's going on in the world. The juniper tree relates the idea of being female, for instance. And in this case with Mirage, in Mirage, the, there is the Vietnam War, Nixon, and so forth are the subjects referred to. This is the performance version of Volcano Saga. I began to work with projections and color as backdrops, reflecting the narrative and placed in relation to the space of the performance. The video is edited to form a parallel narrative to the live action in and around it. In this case, it's on three different screens, two projections showing continuous moving images, narratives related to the story. The third screen is behind a piece of glass that I stand behind at times and use as a sounding board knocking on it or painting on it. The projections are a series of color images or stills that I took when I visited Iceland to work on the piece and record the landscape. Volcano Saga is based on 
um, an Icelandic saga called Laxadala Saga, the only saga about a woman that I could find. I continue to explore this way of telling a story. I do not illustrate the story. I represent it, often using metaphor. The projection and the live performance form parallel narratives. I perform in the image and beside it, always in relation to it. I worked with the composer, Alvin Lussier. I have had many dreams this winter. And four of them in particular have disturbed me greatly. No one has understood them to my satisfaction. But I'm not just asking for a pleasing interpretation. Tell me your dreams. It may be I can make something of them. I dreamt I was standing outside near a stream. I was wearing a headdress on my head, but I felt that it didn't become me, so I was anxious to change it. A lot of people warned me not to, but I paid no attention to them and tore the headdress off my head and threw it into the stream. And that was the end of that dream. In each of these works, I've either made my own soundtracks or worked with a composer. Tilda Swinton played the main part in Volcano Saga. The characters in an Icelandic saga are more three-dimensional than in the fairy tales, as they are based on real historical figures. Fairy tales were two-dimensional, cardboard cutouts, either good or evil. I wanted to have an experienced performer, in this case Tilda, to play the part of Gudrun, the main character, a woman who was married four times. She has a series of four dreams that foretold her future. Ron Vauder, an actor from the Worcester Group, played the seer who interpreted these dreams. After several large-scale epic works, I started to think in miniature terms and the idea of not having myself appear live. I began to make a series of sculptural objects, long wooden boxes echoing the shape of a cone, but squared. Inside the larger end is a stage with a video backdrop. The viewer stands and looks into the box. This piece was the first one I did. It was called Tap Dancing. It's a poetic documentary about a form of dance they do in Cape Breton in Canada. And it's based on a particular folk dance. It's called Step Dancing. This is a little girl. All the children learn these dances. And I made a number of props and objects that represent the stage set within this miniature theater. I've made six of these, and they're all different subjects and different shapes. This is My New Theater 3. You can also see another My New Theater behind this. This is another example of drawing in relation to my body. I put a wet sheet over me, and I drew its outlines on the sheet in charcoal. It looks like my skeleton on the outside of my body. After this, I began to do these drawings and performances by tracing over a big piece of Japanese paper held against my body. I've made many of these drawings. The drawing on the blackboard is of one of my objects that I collect. So in 1968, when I began to publicly perform, I had the desire to develop my own language. I feel the following works, my most recent, are coming together of all of the ideas of the early works. I have developed them into longer and more complicated narratives. This is a shorter one. Ha <laughs> ha 
was my dog, um, my late dog, Zena. She was a natural performer. I never had to tell her what to do. I'm just saying this off the cuff. So whenever I set up my camera and got in front of it, Zena would come next to me, or if I walked away from the camera, she would follow me, or if I walked toward the camera, she would follow me. She was natural. Lines in the Sand was based on a long poem called Helen in Egypt, written by H.D. or Hilda Doolittle. H.D. was an American writer living in the early part of the 20th century who was analyzed by Sigmund Freud in the 30s. I also include quotes from her memoirs, Tribute to Freud. It was written right before the Second World War. I grew up in the Second World War. War is a background condition. There's a section from H.D.'s book about her ana analysis with Freud that refers to this time before World War II in a certain way. There was something beating in my brain. Helen of Troy was blamed for the Trojan War. Of course, a woman had to be blamed. H.D.'s account is based on a classical reference that stated that Helen never went to Troy but went to Egypt. The Helen that was in Troy was a phantom, a copy, and it was actually a trade war. I was thinking of the fact that we are still in war and that the true regions are ne reasons are never made explicit. I am interested in these historic, mythic female figures and the echoing theme of the double. For part of my research, I visited Las Vegas, where we recorded scene in a, scenes in the casino called Luxor. The fake Luxor was juxtaposed against the real Egypt, represented in the work by the photographs that my grandmother took when she visited Egypt at the end of the 19th century. This was an echoing of the theme of the devil. I do not play Helen. There are two of us performing, echoing the real and the fake. In this case, I'm making a drawing of a step pyramid that involves moving with my body while making a mark on a large piece of paper that's suitable to the scale of the performance space or stage. I often become obsessed with one form, in this case, the pyramid and the sphinx, drawing the image over and over again in real time for the audience. Around 2003, I started to develop the shape, the scent, the feel of things. The title of the piece is a quote from H.D.'s writing, but the piece was based on a book by Abby Warburg, Images from the Region of the Pueblo Indians of North America. In the early part of the 20th century, Warburg, a German art historian, visited the Southwest and saw certain ceremonies of an indigenous peoples, the Hopi. Through his writing, I returned to my own memory of seeing the snake dance of the Hopi in Arizona. The piece was designed for an immense space in the basement of an old factory that became the exhibition space of Dia Beacon. In 2005, I began to work with Jason Moran, the jazz composer who composed music and played live in the piece. This has been a long-lasting and important collaboration. We, we continue to work together for reading Dante, reanimation, and they come to us without a word. I designed a large screen on wheels that moved in and out of the corridor of the space, sideways, moving toward and away from the audience, shrinking and expanding the space. The screen appeared as a fourth wall, advancing, receding, and moving out of the space. Major props included a stuffed coyote, a long snake-like structure on wheels, and various sound devices that I played in relation to Jason's sound. The piece was really developed around the text, which then developed into a script, which I worked on for two years. I also spent two years recording video in many locations. My research took me to the desert landscapes of the South Amer southwest of America and Southern California and the woods and beaches of Canada. The haunting images from Salton Sea, for me, representing the, the decay of a certain aspect of American culture and became a backdrop for the song Pastures of Plenty by Woody Guthrie. This scene where I paint the snake is an example of how layers of actions occur in relation to the space and the projection. I move with the music to paint the snake in a condensed period of time while the other performer, Ragani Haas, pulls and swings the snake-like row of linked canvases on wheels. Projected behind this is an image of a stick being used as a drawing tool to draw curving lines in the sand. Here is the final scene, only possible because the unique layout of the Dia space, the character Warburg, 
walks down the length of the enormous warehouse space past the columns. The metal doors roll open, letting in a flood of light as Warburg leaves the sanitarium and the music plays. Reanimation, um, well, th this is a picture of Ande Sambe, who um, has become a singer in several pieces. He's a um, Norwegian uh, Sami human rights lawyer, and um, his songs are, are the, the songs that the Sami sing, although the song he recorded for me was one he made up. It's not a traditional Sami song, but this is he in his Sami outfit. Uh, Reanimation was based on the Icelandic writer Haldor Laxness, under the Glacier, a work of fiction written in 1968. I shot it partly in Norway and partly in my loft in New York. While in Norway, I met a Sami singer named Ande Sambi. We recorded his songs, which are part of the soundtrack. Jason Moran composed and played the music for the performance version after the first version of the installation was shown in Kassel for Documented 13. Reanimation was my first piece where I wanted to include questions about the problems in the environment in my work. Of course, I had always been thinking about these things. I was struck by Laxness writer, writing and the focus on the poetic presence of glaciers, nature and its creatures. I used crystals in the piece because glaciers are made of crystals. Because my work is always set in the present, I had to take into consideration when creating the piece that glaciers are melting. I used footage from a 1973 video called Disturbances, shot in a swimming pool, with shots of women swimming underwater. From my time in Kitakyushu, Japan, with an organization, CCA, I had worked with soji screens. So I reconfigured the piece and had these paper screens made for the video projections. It really alters the perception of the image because it divides the image into a grid pattern. The audience can walk into the architectural space and be surrounded by the projected images and the sound. Also part of the piece, but outside of the room-like space, are two minor theaters playing other video, different video material, part of the piece. In the performance of reanimation, I made a drawing with ink and ice. This is an image of the drawing projected to the crystal and metal structure. I thought of the black ink on the white snow as a kind of polluting element. This is just another example of how I work with drawing. And here I draw on the snow. Well, this is with paint. was an example of Jason Moran and I working together. I love this motif, and we've reused it in different ways. I'm making drawings of birds as fast as I can and sliding pieces of paper away, one after another, inspired by the music. I was particularly inspired by one of Haldor Laxness' descriptions of a bird standing in the storm facing the wind. They come to us without a word. I was invited to represent the U.S. at the Venice Biennale in 2005. 15. Again, this is an example of one work segueing into another. 
I quoted laxness about bees and the miraculous aspect of nature. I wanted to make a piece about animals and include children as performers. For me, this represented the fact of our fragile environment that children will inherit. In each room, there were two projections. One concerned the main subject, the bees, the fish, and the wind, and the homeroom where the children drew animals, for instance. The other projection concerned ghost stories from the oral tradition of Cape Breton, Canada. I thought of the ghosts of creatures. We're, now, this is one of the pieces from the wind room. say that Jason has always played live in my work, although here it's a recorded. Um, and I'll just say that the children, they were then children, uh, are in my newest piece that's in Venice, five of them. And um, it's wonderful. I think they'll be in my next piece too, as they grow, as they become young adults. Um, in this piece, Stream or River Flighter Pattern, birds are a major presence in the work. I also continued to work with children. I recorded video in Vietnam, Spain, Singapore, and Italy. We're going to show part of this piece right afterwards, only six minutes of it. I projected the videos that I shot in various places on the wall in my loft and then performed in front of the projections, as I've done so often. The thread of my work from the very beginning has always been my role as performer. I step into a piece and move, guided by the music, the text, the props, and other performers. This is a piece from that. There are three projections. I continue to explore these ideas in my recent piece about the ocean moving off the land in Venice now. The situation facing the planet is dire, and I am profoundly saddened by this crisis. However, I'm grateful through my work to have gained a deeper understanding for creatures both in the ocean and on the land. I believe if we understand the importance of these miraculous creatures, we can better understand ourselves and live in harmony. Thank you.
Thank you enormously for that, Joan. That was exceptional in terms of being able to get a, a wide sense of, of just how amazing your, your career is and has always been. As Joan uh, mentioned, we're going to have a look at a six-minute clip from a recent work. It's from 2016 to 17 called Stream or River, Flight or Pattern, and then maybe discuss it uh, briefly afterwards. Do you want to say anything Let me before? It was just, um, I went to Vietnam. I, had a, uh, I did a project with Rolex of mentor, mentoring, and I, my uh, mentee was a young Vietnamese um, artist, and I went to visit her, which I was very happy to do in Vietnam, which was complicated for an American, at least for me. And so it was a very interesting trip. I met a lot of young artists, but I, um, there were three pieces in this um, stream of river flatter pattern, and this piece was really inspired by the trip to Vietnam, so we're just showing a little bit of it. Shall we have a look at the, uh, the clip? Yeah, just six minutes. And two of the same children <laughs> who are in all the others. Or in it. Pretty soon, I'm not going to call them children. It's going to be. Well, we're just waiting for that to happen. Can you say a bit more about um, the significance of Vietnam of, for this? Of, of Vietnam. Yeah. Well, for, this. for an American, I grew up. You know, <laughs> I was born in 1936, so I was a certain age, and went during the Vietnam War, which was um, something that we objected to, and um, many of us. And so, to prepare to go to Vietnam for me, it was complex to think, how am I as an American going to visit Vietnam? And so I read this book by Seymour Hersh, I think, who was a journalist who wrote a book called The Best and the Brightest. That's how I prepared, mm -hmm. because I just wanted to understand um, the situation. And the best, and the, it's called that because the people who were in government at the time, the Kennedy, right before the Kennedy administration, but by people that were say neoliberal, I don't know what to say, but it was amazing how we drifted into that war. It was a very detailed description of how a kind of ignorance of the East um, enabled us to, to drift into that war. And, um, but when I got to Vietnam, of course, I didn't discuss it because young Vietnamese do not want to, they call it the American War, of course, and um, they don't really want to um, go back to that moment. And what I kept thinking the whole time I was there is, this is such a, how, do, how could we do this in this beautiful place? But it was better not to discuss it at all because I didn't want my piece or my visit to be about that. I wanted it to be about the present and what they, you know, how they, how the young artists, I was, one of the things I was interested in with my mentee was the idea of censorship. So I wanted to, one of the reasons I wanted to visit Vietnam was to understand uh, how censorship works there and, and how, yeah, how artists respond to it and handle it. And, um, so I was very lucky to meet an older artist who actually was a young person during the war. And his attitude with mine was, her, her first reaction was, oh, I'll take it out. His and my reaction was, no, don't. So then she was able to show it without advertising it. It was a video piece that she couldn't show. When a young artist has a show in Vietnam um, in an institution, they have to send everything they're going to do to the lawyers of the institution who will check it because they don't want to be closed down by the uh, censors, which makes sense because to be closed down is, um, is not a, it's inconvenient and, and then you have to struggle and open up again. But I did go to a wonderful coffee place which was in Hanoi, which was frequented by artists. It was a place where artists gathered that had been closed down several times and it was a house that was reconstructed and rebuilt from a house in the country. So it was a very special place. Anyway, it was incredibly interesting to go there. Okay. Let's have a look at this clip. Coyote on the shelf, looking out window. Lion by the window, wood. Colors covered with writing. Books nailed to table, surveillance, flashback, movement from mad to bird. Animal trail, flight patterns, shadows. Large fox head, paper mache, 
Red mouth, top shelf, looking at coyote. Tiger mask, orange with black markings. Squat, bird, green, purple, yellow. Ceramic with interior bell. Bird on branch, shot, stuffed, brown, varied. Perched owl on green base. Wood is split, heart-shaped face. Gray, oversized elephant. Painted wood, exaggerated trunk. Behind, white wooden carved rabbit. Gentle. Kochi on a boat excursion on these quiet waterways. So the, the three works in this piece were based on different places that I visited. This is obviously Vietnam.
I just want to say briefly, um, just to explain some of um, it. I wouldn't call it a poem. The list of um, that the young man Noah and I are reciting at the beginning are a list of, I collect uh, little animals and all kinds of objects from different places. So I, I was asked to write something about them, so I made a list, a descriptive list of, of my collection. We're reciting that. And then um, the piece actually relates to that with these. Um, in Vietnam, I, I wanted to go to the, these villages outside of Hanoi. Are, each village concentrates on a certain craft. So there's one village where I went and actually bought kites and paper kites, and then to another village, which was called the Paper Village, where they met. I didn't know what that meant until I got there, and that's where they make these animals out of paper. And um, just to make a long story short, uh, these animals were made for the ceremony related to the mother goddess, which is a nature goddess in Vietnam. And right after visiting the place where they made these incredible cre um, animals, we went to a ceremony uh, about yeah, the mother goddess, which different families and people commission um, in relation to an event or a person in their family. And very few people go. There are small ceremonies, but there's a woman at the center of it. And um, these animals and objects are brought into a very small um, altar-like space. And then the woman does some gestures, and then it's taken out, and they're burned. And so I found that I think that's a very um, Kind of symbolic and uh, symbolic act of of relating to making art and and the transitoriness of it. But I'll also just quickly say that uh, uh, I talked yesterday a little bit at the Ruskin School about um, the delicacy of uh, filming things like this in other countries. But I didn't have any. None of the people that I was with minded it, nor did the people that were they're making things. And in that sense, it was a very um, touching and opening experience. So. Really. And I think, sort of thinking precisely on that, that point, one of the, the things that's been really striking, uh, looking at that work in its entirety, actually, is getting a really strong sense of, of place and people and, as you said, sort of rituals and, tr and, and transitoriness, including one's own time within a space. Had you done uh, you know, extensive research on, on different parts of Vietnam before doing that kind of travel, or indeed going, when you go to no, Kochi? I just, I just read this um, one piece about the war, mm. and I did not do, no, I didn't know anything about that. I'd worked a lot with Tao, the young Vietnamese, artist, and she came, you can do your mentorship in any way you want, and she chose to visit me like four or five times. And at one point we went to, um, we spent a week, we, met, we spent two weeks in Rome when I was working on a piece, and she was, her project was about the Portuguese uh, uh, priests who went to Vietnam and actually changed their way of writing. And so she could do her research in Rome mm -hmm. at the Vatican, and then um, we went to Kochi, India, where she could continue her research because there was material there. So I had a very close relationship to her. But, um, and she, plan she actually planned quite a bit of the trip. We mm -hmm. spent a lot of time with other artists in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, and Hanoi, so, which was wonderful. I'd love to go back. Mm. It's a fascinating place. Oh, it's an extraordinary place. Yeah. And what is it about particular sites or, or even gestures uh, in these locations that sort of lures you and, and draws you to them to make you think, oh, I want to bring this into my orbit of storytelling, into the ways that I can think differently about what it means to be a, a person, I a creative find, person um, today. I just, I, very shortly, it's hard to answer that question. Mm. I'm, I, I love magic and ritual and theater, mm. and, um, and that's just inexplicable drawn to it. And also, I'm very interested in the history of all that. As I said, I always study how do things begin, how does art begin? That interests me, it begins with ritual. So I'm very interested in how things begin. And the existence of these remaining rituals, like in Vietnam, the mother goddess. I didn't know about the mother goddess before I went there, so. Because mm. one of the, 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 the 
an anecdote before we sort of open it out a bit is, is the, a very good friend of ours, Uta Metabawa, has, uh, you know, we were traveling together in, in Taiwan. It was a very similar kind of thing to what you've just mentioned. She yeah. saw a, 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 a musical instrument from West Africa in a shop in the southern parts of Taiwan, and her immediate thought was, oh, Joan would love this. <laughs> and just thinking about how those, those drives, those you know, energies for sharing, but also recognizing uh, instruments of, of music, connection, ritual, can be sort of shared I with something like Kuta. It sounds, you know, you pick up something and makes yeah. a sound. I don't care. It doesn't matter where it's from in a way. That's not the issue. The issue. Uta has given me several instruments. She gave me a, a Korean shaman's bell, which I use yeah. in all my performances now. Yeah. And um, Uta lives in Singapore now. And she's a good friend and knows my work. And she, she's a wonderful, I mean, she's a curator, a person, a, um, a wonderful human being, and she uh, is generous, mm. you know, in, in, in relating to people's work. Mm. But. So can I ask, again, just, it might be an impossible question in many respects, but sort of from that, what role then do you think ritual making and storytelling, because you, you said that, that wasn't a, a poem, the, the clip from, from Streamer River, but I think it very much is a poem, and I, I see you and how, you, you know, what you bring to contemporary culture very much as modes of storytelling. What roles do storytellers play or can they play in the current condition of, of the contemporary, which is so often about war and struggle and, and pressures well, and I so think on? That, again, that's a very, I'd have to think for a long time. But I think, again, I think to bring um, a certain kind of pleasure to people's lives. It's not pleasure in the conventional sense but the pleasure of, of, of the spiritual, of art, of um, the imagination, and, and history, and um, the beauty. Mm. I don't know how to answer that, that's all I, yeah. I'm, I'm not a verbal, I'm not a, you know, it's, writing is a little bit torture for me, so. Poetry operates in various no, ways. No, I, I know what you're saying about poetry. Yeah. I say it's not poem because I have a friend who's a poet and I know how hard she works. Uh, Susan Howe. Um, and so I really respect poets. Um, my, po my poetry, it really consists of lists, which could be poems. Mm. And I think my work is, in a, in a certain sense, poetic, not in the romantic sense, but it's in the structure. So from, from the very beginning, I've referred to poetry structure. Mm. You know, the way it looks on the page, the way it condenses thoughts and all that. So in that sense, you said, yeah, it could be poetry. Poetry, poet. And as you said about bringing pleasure and, and through that different ways of thinking about. I mean, art connection. brings us pleasure, yeah. in a very deep sense, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. I think this is a good time to say that there are two, one or two microphones that are two microphones doing the circuits. Uh, just a reminder that um, if you could wait until you receive the microphone before speaking into it. I know you're very eager to ask questions of Joan. Are there any questions uh, there at the moment? There's one up the back there. Thank you for the great lecture. I am a student of Prabhatnik School of Government. And I was surprised to hear that you are much influenced by Japanese traditional stage performance. No, because I also perform it as a hobby. And I would like to, uh, but at the same time in Japan, less and less people are attracted by no, as the emergence of many other forms of entertainment or stage performances and the government subsidizes it to protect the original form of no. My question is, what, you, what do you think about subsidizing the art or performance to protect it? And do you think it is necessary? I think it's really important. I mean, in America, they don't do any of that. They don't substitute. <laughs> they don't consider anything a national treasure. I think it's a wonderful... Um, tradition to consider something like the no, a national treasure, and to support it. It's very important that it, um, 
that certain people, the people that can have time and dedication to um, continue to, to perform that form. Um, my work doesn't look like the No Theater, and I don't imitate it. There are certain things that inspired me about it very deeply, and that, you know, there, there are things that can be translated into other, um, into, say, what I do, which is the idea of dance theater, which No is, and also the idea in the No of the very simple use of props, the, um, you know, just made out of sticks and paper, and that's one of the things that attracted me to the no. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's very important that you support it. And, and the Bunraku Theater is amazing theater, amazing. Yeah, we mentioned yesterday about um, the relationship of your work to minimalism, the American, uh, particularly New York practices of, of minimalism. But of course, no is a type of minimal theater and a minimal performance as well, and yet is a very different kind of, yeah. of minimalism that is engaging with different aspects of the theatrical and ritual and, and so forth, and sort of a very important well, way of no thinking influenced, differently. Well, no influenced, it wasn't just me, it was like the um, Irish poet Yeats and his group were very interested in the no because there were certain things in the no in the no plays, uh, the relation to landscape, the relation to ghosts, there are ghosts in the no theater. Ireland loves ghosts, you know. <laughs> there are millions of them in Ireland. <laughs> anyway, and, um, and then Ezra Pound. So a book influenced me by Ezra Pound and Fenelosa about the no that they wrote. In the, it was, they just had their 100 year anniversary last year. And um, Yeats wrote a play in the no tradition, and an artist made an exhibition like this at the Japan Society about that group of people that, um, that loved no one. And you know, Artaud loved um, also Eastern theater. So as opposed to Western theater, for me, Western theater, okay, I'm interested in it, I'd love to go see a play, and, but I wasn't interested in doing a verbal, um, something relates, rela based on language, really. And, but the no, although it is based on language too, as a foreigner, I couldn't understand the language, of course. So I saw it visually and the movement and the images and the um, music. The music in the no is very important. So for all those reasons. Are there are more questions. There's a question up the third row there. Hi, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much, not only for a wonderful talk, but also for the great pleasure that you've given all of us, with all the works over, over the course of your career. I just wanted to ask about, um, you mentioned uh, that you, in, I think early on, looked at paintings by Piero and Sassetta. And I just wondered, do you go back to those works? Do you go back to early painters, two-dimensional works, often? Whenever I am in a place where I know there is, a, like I just was in Venice, so I haven't for, like, I, maybe the last time. I don't every time go to the academia, but, um, there's a particular painting there by Tintoretto that I find amazing. That I mean, now I've seen, I mean, your tastes also change and they shift. If there's Sassetta in that period of Italian painting, I look at it. I go to the museum and I look at that period. Um, I also look at um, Piero. But Tintoretto, I just, in the last like 10 years, have gotten interested in Tintoretto in a different way. And I remember once I was sitting next to Frank Stella in front in the British Museum, every once in a while I'd run into him in front of a painting someplace in the world, and he told me how much he loved Tintoretto. And I see it in his work, you know, I can see his love of Tintoretto. So yes, I do, in short. There's a question up the front. Wondered if I could ask you to say a little bit more about your, the relationship of animals in your work, particularly the dog. And I don't know whether I'm remembering wrongly, but did you not once make a video of howling at the moon as if you were a dog? And I just, I'm just really curious to know how that fits into the whole picture of your practice. Well, I love dogs, and I always had a dog. As an adult, I've had three different dogs. And um, the howling for organic honey, I was reading actually Juna Barnes' book, I can't remember the, t name, the title of it, but in it she howls like a dog at some point. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I've always identified with animals, 
And being close to a dog, you, you sort of... Um, I mean, in this one you just saw, my dog was howling. And I love that scene. I always show it because that particular dog... I, I think it's very interesting the way dogs... I don't train them at all. I'm not interested in training them. But right now I have a dog named Ozu, the poodle that was in this. And, and Ozu is not a performer. <laughs> He's, um, maybe, maybe in the next few years I can get him to perform. But he, like all my other dogs would jump through a hoop at the moments, the drop of a hat. Ozu, the minute I take the hoop out, he runs away. So I don't know what there is about it. To say about my relationship to animals, um, uh, it's a natural relationship. And I collect images of animals. I was just at the Pitts River Museum today, and it's amazing. I just did a show at the Gardner Museum in Boston in which I photographed as many of the animals in the collection I could find, and then I made drawings of them of, of my, from my photographs. And that I have a show there now of all these drawings of animals. So it's just become more and more of uh, uh, an interest. And I suppose somebody asked me last night if I ever want to do anything else. I think I would be an animal. I would work with animals. Like, I would love to work with elephants. What a wonderful thing to do. Um, they must be amazing. Um, and so on and so forth. And since I'm working with fish, we don't call them animals. But I didn't know about fish before this project with the oceans that's now in Venice. And now I have a very different relation to fish because I perform. The, I perform with that ritual images. This isn't really ad answering your question why, but I'm just um, trying to describe the different moments. And I, I started working with dogs in the piece because when I started working with the organic honey piece, I was working with things around me. The idea of the bricolage and uh, the working with things at hand. You know, uh, my grandmother had a collection of fans. I had a dog. They all got into the piece, you know, because they were there. They were in my family. They were in the room. So I work with what's around me and what I find. Can I bounce off that, actually? Because what's striking for me about you know, the incredibly rich practice that you have shared with us today and, and for the last 50 years is just how important collaborations of so many different kinds are, including collaborations with animals, but between people. You've mentioned a number of people that you're, you've worked with over the, the years, between disciplines. Um, but also I see the, the layering in your works and the dialogue between your new and past works as, as kinds of collaboration as well. And I wonder, if, could you talk a bit more about that importance of collaboration for you, which you know, obviously extends to, to animals and, and the dogs that you have, and, and how you see collaboration propelling those new ideas in your work? Well, I have to say right away that um, the word collaboration, first of all, I have to say that I'll just define what yeah. my relate. So for me, a true collaboration, if you say, we collaborated together on this piece, for me, a true one is when you start together and you uh, share an idea and you develop it together. That's a true collaboration. Then um, there is, I w yesterday I was talking about being a film director. You don't say to film directors, you make collaborations, do you? Mm. Especially male film directors. Mm. Anyway. So my idea about, I, I work with other people. I would say I work with. And um, the way I work is that I'm the director and I ask them to come and do things. Like Gordon Mata Clark, you know, he did what I told him to do in that piece. And, but with other, Gordon, that's Gordon. That's what he wanted to do. That's the way we used to work together. And um, if I was in a piece of Yvonne Rayner's, she would tell me what to do. So you wouldn't call that a collaboration. Um, people don't ask. Um, and I thought about with Jason, um, it's probably more and more I've become more relaxed about it. Um, working with, a film, with filmmakers, they have certain skills I don't have. So with Babette, she knew how to use a camera. But I told her exactly what to do, you know, what I wanted. Because, so I'm the director, the film director. And with Jason Moran, I do the backdrop, the idea of the piece. He does the music, period. But I understand um, when we were developing the piece, we worked for six weeks together at Dia Beacon. And I, I had all the, uh, the script and the backdrops all 
I didn't have the movements. So the way we worked together was every day, we went there for six weeks during the, not every day of the week, but five days a week, and he would play and I would move. And he worked off my movements and I worked off his music. It, music inspires me. So in that sense, it is a club. And when people see the work that Jason and I have done together, to them, it's not like the way I see it. They see this thing that's all one thing. So in that sense, yeah, it's a collaboration in that sense. But I see everybody is playing certain parts. So one of the reasons I do what I do is because from the very beginning, I really like to work with other people. So I enjoyed Ragini Haas, who was in, I mentioned her name, a young, she was a student in Germany that I worked with in Stuttgart. You know, I would show her how to move I'd say, I want you to do this and this exactly like this. And she would do it, and of course it would be her doing it, and it would be different from me doing it. And I liked very much the way she worked with her bot, the way she would put it in her, in her own, um, it wouldn't be different, it would be just what I did, but it would be her doing it. So it wouldn't be like a carbon copy. So that, um, I really enjoyed working with her, it was wonderful. It's very hard to find somebody like that. Mm. I don't have anybody like that right now. But I do, there's one, <laughs> there's one person in the audience who came from London, um, um, Francesco Miliacci. He was in my pieces in, um, so we did two things in London. We did the mirror pieces in which that's not a collaboration. They're performers who are directed, right? In the piece, we, Francesco's in my fish piece, my oceans piece, moving off the land uh, in the performance. And I really felt it, it takes time and I felt for the first time the other night, I was watching the way you were moving, and I was saying, oh good, now he got it, you know, finally. But you got it, you know? So Francesco can move, so I choose people who can move, who um, have a certain skill. Actually, Nefeli chose you. <laughs> um, so now I'm working with this wonderful young woman who I met at Documenta in 2013, who's directing my mirror pieces for me. So. I can't do it all myself, and um, I'm becoming more relaxed about opening up in that sense. Yeah. So I have mixed, I define collaboration in different ways. Yeah, what a fantastic I mean, I think answer. you have to um, talk about it in different ways. Yeah. Fantastic answer, it's the best answer I've heard to that kind of question people, so thank you. More questions out there, at the front there. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, the movie, I really admire. My question is, it sounds a bit primitive, but the role of the modern art, because talking about the Japanese as like no or haiku, although the gap exists between the sender and receiver about the meaning of the understanding, right? Uh, in terms of the entertainment. And uh, so somewhere, if we study or understand, we can get some meaning. But like your case is so eccentric, so inspiring. But the gap is bigger and bigger between sender and receiver, like, you know, innocent audience like me. So but that, my question is very simple. So is it something like that, try to, you know, what do you say, expanding the gap about understanding between sender and the receiver, and then let them, you know, what do you say, leave, I mean, to get some meaning by themselves? Is your question, um, do I consider the way my work is seen by the audience and the fact that they don't understand it often. Well, the, yeah, sharing the meaning, the issue is important yeah. or not, yes. Um, my work is difficult for many people. I know that because people tell me. And um, I can't really worry too much about that. I, ha I mean, if you read, how many things have you read that you understood the first time? I mean, for instance, some poetry is very hard to understand the first time. I'm reading, at the moment, Dante. And there's one verse that I really love. It seems to me, I won't recite it, but it, I've looked at it so many times and tried to understand it. And of course, it's the translation from the Italian to the English. And then you think, what did the translator think? But um, it's simply a fact that I cannot worry about that gap. And I hope that people find their own way. And I'm sure everybody who comes, many people who come to my work, see it in different ways. And I'm always interested in the way people come up to me and say, oh, 
that was that or that was this. And I think, oh, that's interesting. You know what I mean? So when you mentioned the no, what did you mean about the no theater? It, although sometimes difficult to the contrary people, but the bottom line is some meaning to can be shared yeah, if you study. Well, that's because yeah. they understand the language, I think. And there's a story in the no. This, the no theater is a narrative, a story. And mine is not. So I don't explain the same way the no drama. I do not explain it in the same way. So I don't have that narrative. So that's the big difference between, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we need a proper translator, right? Well, between, I don't know. Uh, I think it's, um, there are certain people that write about my work, and I think certain people understand it better than others. I don't, it's not something that concerns me. I can't worry about that. I go crazy. Um, I just have to keep doing the work and hoping that people will enjoy it. I always say to people, don't try to understand it. I mean, one of my things I say, don't try to understand it certainly in a logical way, just en enter into it and see what happens. So we've got another question, second row there and then second row here. Thank you very much for your generous talk and sharing so intimately about your process. I was really curious about the notion of play in your work and maybe building off these questions of collaboration but particularly how play was so important in moving against so many artists who are working in very different ways in the 60s and 70s, and how play may be in relationship towards expectations around gender or sexuality or ways of being together in society, and how play perhaps kind of turns around notions of working and, and being in very different ways. Um, from time immemorial, um, people have developed there are two kinds of play. One is children's play. I mean, they're not really two kinds, two related aspects. Children's play. And then the play, the word improvisation, you know, is another word like collaboration. I'm always wanting to ask 10 jazz musicians, what is improvisation, you know? There's always a theme in jazz. And um, dancers and people who work in theater improvise a lot, not in public, but to develop their work. And improvisation is a kind of play, but it's a very directed play. So, I mean, in certain instances. For instance, um, when I'm working on a piece, I, I call it trying things out. You know, you have certain props, you have objects, materials. One has to work with these things and <coughs> improvise before you find a way to use them. And so that's a form of play. But from the very beginning, I've been interested in play. And um, I probably play differently than I, now than I used to, because I have developed a lot of um, ideas and, and techniques. And uh, it's very hard, as a, however old I am, to you can't ever go back to the fresh beginnings that you used to. But um, I think improvisation and play are an important part of the process for every artist, almost every artist, if that answers your question. I mean, you, you mentioned a lot of subjects in relation to that, and those are all just different um, ideas relating to it that somebody, this person or that person, will bring in gender play. You know, let's dress up in different costumes and pretend, or um, let's pretend, or let's not pretend, or whatever. So there are different ways of playing with all those things you talked about. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering what your opinion was on all women exhibitions, because I know you were, of course, in WAC, and um, how do you like your work to be shown, or how, yeah, how your gender um, kind of adds or subtracts from how your work is shown? Um, well, very seldom am I in a show with old women, and that used to be um, certainly an issue in the late 60s and early 70s when women were so badly represented, underrepresented in major shows, they still are. It's gotten much better than it was then. Um, so at some points, the only thing I can say about that, I loved being in WAC because that was an important show about it. It was an idea, a certain idea, um, um, and important. 
Uh, a lot of women I know, including myself, do not. It's like what happened, well, anyway, do not want to be in shows with all women. We want to be equal, and we want to be considered with the men and not be separated out as being female, doing female work, doing woman's work. No, that's not what I want. But um, I'm not against it in any way. And I'm just saying for now, it's a question that we used to ask a lot in the, in the, 70s, in the early 70s, late 60s. And a lot of women did not want to be in an all-woman show. But I'm, I'm sure I was in a show. I can't remember exactly, but not very often. I think asking that question now is very different from asking that question then, because it's not the issue the same way. When I started teaching in the 70s, I would go to a school, there would be no women teaching. You know what I mean? That's what it was like then. Now many women are teaching. There are many women students, but there's not an equal number of women artists in shows. I mean, the number of women artists includes it. In shows does not equal the number of women artists in schools, if you know what I mean, the proportions. But. I mean, it's striking that at the Ruskin, for instance, I would say that about 80% of our students would identify as female. And it's, it's crucial that we have these discussions about uh, feminist art practices and art histories and how they entwine with various other kinds of, of uh, intersectional practices yeah, as well. Is, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I have to apologize all the time. When, I, when we use the word woman and man and... Um, so I'm, yeah, because I've been, if you don't teach, you're not in touch with some of these terms. And um, I haven't taught for about four years. But I went to Mount Holyoke, an all-woman's college, and um, the last, I went there, I did a, I did a um, a piece there, and I was invited to be the artist of the year, blah, blah, blah. So I said, are you admitting men now? And they said, no, but we're admitting transgender. So, um, and all the students at Mount Holyoke uh, uh, label, they, they don't say woman or man. Some of them do, but a lot of them have the in-between, have a different way of describing themselves. So I think it's a very different question now, also, because of that, that there's many overlapping terms and different ways of considering. You wouldn't have an all-woman's uh, show. It would be a little complicated to call it that right now, don't you think? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the recognition of the sheer fluidity of, of experience and being and life and desire. And I think, again, that's sort of something that, that your work is exploring, going right back to the 60s and yeah. 70s and, and sets. Uh, a, a lot of the, the foundations for thinking creatively about identity and presence, and certainly has been for our students. Uh, yeah. Exactly. More questions out there. Sabrina up the front there. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about um, humor and your use of humor in your work, if it's an active um, part of your thinking and creating process, or if it's a byproduct and side effect, and um, I mean, on a kind of basic level, how, how you decide something's funny or when you add that in. Well, I mean, um, I'll tell you first of all that I'm fascinated by comedy. I think it's one of the di most difficult forms. Uh, how do you, how is to be funny? Per, uh, consciously, I'm going to be funny. And so I, and also, I'm very fascinated, but I don't know if you saw The King of Comedy by Scorsese, in which the, Jerry Lewis plays a comic who's very nasty. So a lot of comics are quite nasty people. My stepfather was very funny and very nasty. He was, he was also a comic in his you know, spare time. He used to recite um, at the dinner table, I don't know if you know the playwright Eugene O'Neill, and Eugene O'Neill had people, the characters in his plays, speak um, with nobody else in the play could understand them except the audience. And they would say things about everybody else. And, and my stepfather used to do that at dinner. He would talk about all the people in the room. So he was very funny and smart and nasty. So I grew up with that. And I became, and the early comedians, Imogene Coca and Sid Caesar, I adored, as many people did. It's a very important part of our culture. Um, I always say, as a performer, I have to be willing to make a fool of myself. 
I could not be purposely funny. It's not something I do purposely. I know I am sometimes funny, and I enjoy humor. And um, some people, some people in my audience who have known me for a long time, think I'm very funny. You know, but I don't mean to be funny. So I don't mind if they think I'm funny, but when I'm trying to be serious. So I don't mind that. It's not something I myself do not find it possi uh, possible to be consciously funny. If that answers your question, but it's a very important. Um, I think, as an, especially as an old woman, I think th there was an actress, an American actress, Ruth Gordon, who acted into her old age. She was a comedian, and she was funny. I think it's very important for old people sometimes um, to have a humor, because otherwise it's sad. Do you know what I mean? Can't be sad. So there you are. That's all I can say about it. I think humor is also one of those, just thinking again about how your work engages with historical material, whether it be Piero Estacetta or going back even further. Humor is one of those great sort of wormholes of time. You think about Aristophanes writing you know, millennia ago, and people are still laughing now, and that sense that of, of laughter as this mechanism across centuries, even this one gesture as a mechanism across centuries, I think it's yeah. crucial. Yeah. Laughter is important. More questions? Well, maybe while people are uh, discovering questions in their mind, I might ask actually, I mean, it's sort of it's a bit different from, from humor, but still thinking about um, you know, those questions of, of when you were making work in the 60s and 70s and now, and of course now performance and, and moving image work, and particularly video, are, are such a strong part of contemporary practices, uh, whether it be in galleries like the Tate, or especially in art schools like the Ruskin. And I wonder how performance and video art can speak to those kinds of social pressures of social media today. You know, what are some of the insights that you gleaned in the 60s and 70s that are particularly relevant to how young artists respond to those pressures now? Um, first of all, I'm very out of touch with young artists, even if I go to schools, because I don't Go to gal I can't go to all the galleries and see everything that's going on, even if I'm interested. But I will say that when, um, when we all got, especially in relation to the women's movement, it was very evident a lot of women got video cameras and um, they were able to, I, 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 I wrote something about it once, but they were able to scream or yell into the video camera and um, express their anger and frustration. And um, I'm sure that's true now in social media, but it's such a cacophony of, um, it's hard to follow. Um, it's so out of control. I don't know. It's hard for me to answer that question. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's very important to, to understand what's going on in the world and to try to think about your work in relation to that backdrop or that context whatever that is. I think it's very important um, in communicating with other, with other cultures in other parts of the world for us to see each other's work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that work is political and reflecting what's going on in these different countries. And um, I wish I had more time, I, I think, to, to see more of this work because then I understand a little bit more about um, those situations. Mm -hmm. Do you think in the 60s and 70s the situation, I mean, because it was a time of great upheaval for so many people, as you mentioned about the American War in Vietnam and, and different kinds of screaming into the wind, as Yoko Ono had written in Grapefruit. Was the situation still about uh, you know, that, that sense of control or being out of control with image cultures at that point, no, with, with technology? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, not in the same way that it is now at all, no. Um, you know, there was television. There was video art, which, which you know, had a very um, low, like my, I was very lucky in the very beginning, Channel 13, which is the PBS public channel in, in America or in New York, had a program every Friday that showed video art, like my art. It was the only outlet. And um, otherwise, it was like being a, you know, poets have a hard time. And it was like, it was like being a visual poet. 
your work was um, seen in some galleries, and you were known in a certain circle, but not widely known at all. And there was no out. And then we always thought, oh, cable television, when that comes, mm -hmm. that'll be a place for us. No, it came quickly. Um, there was no place for us. And, and I would say it's a little bit still that way. But there is the internet. And so that's the good thing. The wonderful thing about the internet and all things connected with it is that that's how people know, how, that's how we know each other now, is one of the ways, is we see each other. Um, yeah, you can look up people and find out about them and see their work, see some of their work, not all of it. You can't really experience it in the same way. So um, it's become expanded, greatly expanded. And for me, it's, you know, for me as a tiny little person, it's not a very different experience for me. I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My name is Paul. Um, that was a wonderful talk and wonderful answers to questions. You were a pioneer of using a particular technology. Can I ask you if your practice has been a struggle against that technology or whether you've sort of floated in the sea of the various video technologies that you've used? No, I was not. You know, when that technology came out, it wasn't something that I had to work against. I embraced it fully. It was um, as many people did. At that time, I mean, it's a very different time. You can't imagine. You're, you're not that young, but you can't imagine what it was like for artists you know, Bruce Nauman, all the people you can think of, to suddenly be able to work in their studios um, and make videos right there and then. And also to find this new way of relating a technology to the body in real time. And uh, to take over storytelling from filmmaking, but in a poetic way. Um, so, no, I did not work against it at all. But in, in a way, my work is um, a counter. You know, there was, um, before video, before the video cameras, filmmakers hated video cameras, the filmmakers that I knew. But before us, there were filmmakers. There were underground filmmakers who um, many of us knew and appreciated their work. And um, those, that, the, the, the history of film is very important um, as a, Part of the develop, I don't think that a lot of, I would say my advice to young video artists, look at film, look at the history of film, because that's the way all this began. And in order to, in order to develop my work, I had to know the history of film, which is early filmmaking. And so I was inspired by that. So for me, it wasn't a rebellion at all. It was a continuation and a using and a relating to the history of film and bringing that into my work. So no, no, not at all. I mean, right now, I think um, I might be a little more, you know, contrary about what's happening now in the world with, with media and how it's affecting us. I might just um, wrap up by, I mean, you've been asked many times the last couple of days about uh, advice, and you, know, you, you mentioned that again just then, about advice to younger artists or to your younger self and so on. So I, I kind of wonder whether I can slightly rephrase that question by asking, what's in a sense been the biggest inspiration for you, whether in the past or ongoing, that just keeps driving that impulse to want to continue to be an artist? You said yesterday, uh, in the Sheldonian Theatre, you just knew you had to be an artist. What's the, the, are there inspirations think, that continue um, that? Yeah, maybe I should, we should be in the psychiatrist's office or something for that. <laughs> because um, it has to do with, um, as I said yesterday, being passionate about art and interested in what other people are doing. And I think the word competition was brought in yesterday. And I wanted to say, competition is not a bad thing, but 
I mean, one of the things that keeps me going now is being continuously asked to do another project. You know, it's like also from the very beginning of being conditioned by school deadlines. I mean, this is all the less attractive, romantic, less romantic things about what drives an artist, you know. And, um, oh, I wish my father was here so he could see how it worked out. But that's not what drives me, of course. Um, he didn't even see me begin, but, uh, and I wasn't even that, I didn't even know my father very well. But the reason, I liked um, H.D.'s book about Freud very much. It's a wonderful book, Tribute to Freud, it's called. And, um, and her relationship to, to Freud. And uh, God, I'm not answering your question, I don't That's know. Okay. I'm just rambling. No, you're doing See, wonderfully. It's, so it's much hard. more interesting. But, but I think it's a combination of things, besides what I say, passion for art, and also seeing another person's work that inspires you. Or I look at um, films inspire me a great deal. And I go to a film, and um, when I'm trying to think of an idea, like there's a several things. So if I'm trying to look for an idea, so I reread this book by Pound and Fenelosa when I was working on Stream or River Flight or Pattern about the no. And I didn't really, um, I didn't use it at all, but I, I took lines from the no plays and I put them together in different orders and made my own poem <laughs> from, the no, from the no plays. And, but I didn't really, it didn't become part of the piece. So there are all these uh, triggers that one uses to get, it's hard, I have to say. Um, it's scary and hard. And, and still is, which I think is probably good. It should never be easy. Um, but it's, an, it's just a drive to, um, to stay in the present. It's a drive to stay alive, really, in a way, because if, if I like, maybe I'll never get up again, you know? <laughs> so, and I enjoy, I enjoy it. At, sometimes it's awful and I hate it, but then there's the enjoyment when it works or when it comes out. And when the performance works, sometimes it doesn't, but when it works. And um, it's just in my blood. You know, it's in my body. I have to do it, that's all. I don't know what else to say. Well, other than that, uh, to say that it has been sheer enjoyment having you here in Oxford and a great pleasure to have your works in our lives. Um, congratulations on being the recipient of the Kyoto Prize. Thank you to the Inamori Foundation for their support. And may I ask all of us to uh, celebrate Joan's wonderful work and join with me in a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. that